I used to think the Costa Ricans probably live so long because they spent their morning surfing and they got to hang out with monkeys most of the day. Like it's a pretty low stress life. But when you look at their diet, it really highlights some things that are different, especially from the other blue zones. Now, when you look at Costa Ricans, they have a phenomenal life expectancy, but there's one particular region it's called the Nicoyan Peninsula. These Nicoyans live extraordinarily long. They have an average life expectancy over 90 years old. To give context, the United States, we're talking like mid 70s, a huge difference. Now, it's also presumably the highest concentration of people over the age of 100 in the world. Now, there's some speculation there and some people will like combat me on that. But you know, when you look at the literature, it's a pretty high concentration of people over the age of 100. But what's even more phenomenal than that is that they're free from disease, they're generally free from disability, and they have a very low instance of medications. So what's most important here is their health span. Their health span into their 90s is unreal. In fact, that's what Costa Rica in general is really known for, is having tremendous health span and vitality well into their 90s. As I've said in other videos, who cares if you're living to be 120 if you're in bed from the time you're 80 on, right? So being like ready to roll at 90, that's pretty awesome. There was a study that was published in Demography that looked at Costa Ricans and they found that at age 90, Costa Ricans had a 14% higher average life expectancy than the average of the 13 highest income countries. Now, the reason I mention this is high income regions typically have a high life expectancy of better medical care, probably more affordability for healthier things that are usually expensive. The list goes on. Like higher income usually equates to longer life expectancy. But in this particular case with the Costa Ricans, at 90, they had a 14% higher life expectancy than all those other high income regions. Like, so something is very specific here that we have to analyze. Now, additionally, the life expectancy at 90 is about 4.4 years. Compare that to other regions. Some don't even have a life expectancy past 90. Okay, but when you pinpoint kind of what the differences are, first of all, just in their overall entirety, significantly lower cardiovascular disease and significantly lower obesity levels than almost anywhere in the world, let alone the blue zones. So it's really interesting because they have some of the lowest cardiovascular disease and lowest obesity rates out of all the blue zones. And you know what's really interesting? They eat a fair bit of animal protein. So it's kind of wild. It doesn't seem to be about the meat intake or the protein intake. That is Costa Rica specifically. Then when you look at the Nicoyans, it gets even more wild. At age 60, the Nicoyans have seven times the average life expectancy than those in Japan. And Japan is considered a blue zone, or at least Okinawa is, but Japan is known for having a long life expectancy. Nicoyans at 60, seven times longer life expectancy than Japan. What in the world? And the biggest thing that seems to be standing out is the diet. Because what's wild is when you look at all these different blue zones, there's a lot of different things. Living with purpose, uh, laughter, stress, relationships, sex, all these things do matter for sure. But with Costa Rica specifically, the biggest glaring one is the diet. And there's one really important thing that I'm not tooting my own horn here, but I have stressed for years. Okay, now I know I'm a big intermittent fasting guy and I'm not about to recommend that with them because the Costa Ricans don't really fast, but they do what I recommend doing on the days I do not fast. So I fast a couple days a week. All the other days, I eat a large breakfast, a medium lunch, and a very small dinner. That is my goal. I try to eat that way as much as I can. And when you look at the literature, there's a lot of stuff to back it up. We'll talk about it in a second. But the Nicoyans, they roll out of bed before dawn Okay, and usually right about dawn, sometimes they go and go horseback riding and they do some of their work before breakfast. You look at different sub-regions of this and subcultures, it's kind of interesting. But either way, they're up early, getting on with their day, and then they're having a big breakfast. Beans, chicken, corn tortillas, and quite a bit of coffee. Hmm, chicken for breakfast. Sounds like kind of huevos rancheros to me and I'll take that, maybe just without the chips, right? Anyhow, diving in more, we see some other interesting things. High amount of black bean intake, high amount of poultry, high amount of squash. We're gonna break down each of these things 
specifically. So let's talk first about the segmenting of the meals that is so different from a lot of other regions. In America, we grab and go. We grab like a light and fit yogurt or we grab that granola bar and we head on out the door and then we stack our calories towards the end of the day. There was a study that was published in Obesity Reviews, took a look at nine studies and the evidence was very clear. When calorie distribution was skewed towards the morning, much less obesity, much less overall risk of certain diseases and cardiovascular issues, and significantly less insulin resistance. Our circadian clocks do not want us to be loading up on food later in the day. That makes zero sense from an energy balance standpoint. Eat more in the morning where you're gonna burn it off. Eating the right food, you won't feel fatigued. Your body has more ability at a genetic level to burn through the fuel you eat in the morning than it does stacking it towards the evening. I have seen this not only in the literature, not only in people that I've coached and talked to, not, even in, not only in professional athletes, but in myself when I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I see it super clear where if I eat food in the morning, my body handles it and my glucose levels stay nice and stable. If I eat a lot of food in the evening, even if I've been active that day, whooshing, it goes way up, big spike. And I see this in real time with a continuous glucose monitor. And it's really the only way that you can kind of test it yourself to see, okay, you could prick your finger and do that, but I think a continuous glucose monitor makes it a little bit easier to see that and actually have the data in front of you. I put a link down below if you want to get a continuous glucose monitor. A lot of people think you can only get one with like a specific prescription or whatever. It's not the case. Like you can get one through Cygnos where you get a Dexcom continuous glucose monitor and then you use the Cygnos app which takes the data from the Dexcom continuous glucose monitor and it uses an algorithm to show you kind of your predicted scores or your predicted levels and like when you're rising, when you're crashing. It tells you so much as, hey, your blood sugar is rising, you should go for a walk or you should do some squats or some push-ups. Very helpful coaching tools as well, but it's a very sophisticated algorithm that doesn't just give you a snapshot of, hey, your glucose is high. It gives you a specific range you should be in. So if you're looking at controlling your glucose a little bit better and understanding when you're using food better and when you're not, there's no better indicator, in my opinion, of your metabolomics and how you're using fuel than what happens to your glucose when you eat. If you spike, maybe that was a time you shouldn't have been eating quite so much. If you can control it, you can spike and come down, then hey, your body's in control, but you gotta see what works for you. So that link is down below. That is a 15% off discount link too. So I highly recommend it. Top link, top line of this description underneath this video. Now, interestingly, they eat a lot of guava, they eat a lot of pineapple, they eat a lot of plantains. Okay, so they eat a lot of these like higher sugar tropical fruits, but these are also exceptionally polyphenol rich. They also eat a ton of blackberries. Blackberries grow a lot and blackberries are super high in anthocyanins. So we look at kind of the fruit that we eat here in America, not that it's bad, but we eat a lot more of this like fruit that isn't super rich in these polyphenols. Right, we get kind of, maybe we'll eat some apples, we'll eat some pears, which are good, they have fiber and stuff, but we're not eating the berries and the blackberries, those dark berries like we should. Anyhow, let's talk black beans for a second because you know, I had Dr. Gundry on the channel not that long ago. He's obviously not a huge fan of black beans because of the lectins, but when you look at the Nicoyans, they eat a lot of black beans, but a good majority of their carbohydrates come from black beans. They don't eat a ton of other carbohydrates other than the fruit and maybe some rice but one cup of black beans has 15 grams of fiber. Okay, whoop-de-doo, fiber. Actually, what seems to be more interesting is the copper, the manganese, the magnesium, and the iron levels of black beans. We are starting to see literature that's suggesting that minerals are one of the most important things. Low levels of magnesium are strongly associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And when we look again at the Nicoyans and why they live so long, we can speculate that it's less obesity, more blood sugar modulation, and less cardiovascular disease. So minerals play a big part here, but they're not the only piece. Remember how I mentioned they eat a lot of animal protein? The Nicoyans eat a ridiculous amount of chicken as a proportion to their other protein sources. And when you look at them compared to other blue zones, they eat a monumental amount of poultry over Japan. Now, Sardinia and Greece, they eat a fair bit of animal protein and they eat a decent amount of poultry. But we're looking at potentially double the amount of poultry that the Costa Ricans eat or the Nicoyans eat. Now, poultry, low calorie, very high protein, 
super rich in niacin and super rich in thymine and some of these other things that are very important. When we look at longevity, niacin is very critical because niacin assists in DNA repair. And as we get older, DNA repair becomes very important. So a niacin-deprived diet could, in theory, have more DNA mutation. I'm not, I'm kind of speculating there, but I think the biggest piece is they get a lot of protein. They get all the benefits of the blue zones that we talk about, sunlight, the polyphenols, this and that, but hey, they're also getting a ton of poultry in. And if you look at the randomized control trials and you look at a lot of them, I hate to break it to you, there is a strong bias towards high poultry intake and lower body weight and lower cardiovascular disease. Hmm. Less obesity, less CVD. Sounds like the Nicoyans. What is going on here? Let's talk squash. This is super unique, okay? Not a lot of blue zones eat copious amounts of squash. Yeah, you've got fiber, you've got a ton of vitamin A, which could be toxic if you have a whole lot, but you're not going that overboard. Okay, when you're looking at squash, one of the most interesting things is the beta carotene content. Beta carotene, powerful antioxidant, does a number of different things in the body that are tremendous for us and help us feel good in the moment and longer term. But the literature really says it clearly. Scientific reports published a paper looking at seven different studies. High circulating levels of beta carotene led to a 31% reduction in all-cause mortality. Yeah, we're talking something serious here. If there's one thing we've learned from even olive oil and berries is that antioxidants matter. Beta carotene is a separate category altogether of those. And clearly, when you look at the randomized controlled trials, human trials, that clearly have merit, a 31% reduction in all-cause mortality is nothing to sneeze at. Clearly something's going on there. So I'm tempted to add some more squash to my diet as a result. Now here's one of the weirdest things. And I didn't mention this earlier, so I'm hoping that you're sticking with the video because this is very intriguing. They drink very hard water. The water there is sitting on like a significant, like 80% limestone bedrock, right? And there's other regions of the world, ironically a lot of blue zones, that have this very hard water. What is it about the hard water? We're kind of told in America that maybe softening your water is good because no one wants hard water. It's going to clog your pipes and there's lots of minerals in it, but kind of intriguing. There is a strong association between hard water intake and number of centenarians. When you look at the regions that have hard water, they tend to have higher levels of centenarians. At least it's correlated. Now, the chances are this has to do with the increase in magnesium. I mentioned a study earlier, there's reductions in cardiovascular disease risk when magnesium is increased, or actually vice versa. When magnesium is low, there's an increase in cardiovascular disease risk. Interestingly enough, a study published in European Journal of Preventative Cardiology showed that hard water intake was correlated with lower cardiovascular disease risk. So we've seen hard water with centenarians, we've seen hard water with lower cardiovascular disease risk. We know hard water has a lot of magnesium. We know lower magnesium is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. What more do we need to know? Does that mean that everyone needs to go out and drink hard water? Not necessarily, because the tap water that's coming out of your faucet is probably a little bit different. But if you're ever getting bottled water or glass water, please, for the love of all things good, opt for the spring water, not the purified water. Okay, go for the spring water. One of the things I've noticed is like when I drank purified water for a long time and I went to spring water, spring water had like a weird, almost bitter taste. Now I learned to look for that kind of bittery taste. Cause I'm like, ah, that's the minerals. That's that magnesium, maybe a little bit of calcium, maybe a little manganese, these things we need. The last thing that is a little woo wooey that you're gonna roll your eyes about, but it's only for the people that have stuck it through the end of this video, is they have what they call plan de vida. Life with a purpose. They are very big about purpose. The villages there, the people there, they have roles and they are sort of assigned those roles and they follow through with those roles. The fishermen, the shepherd, the this, the that. I'm just being hypothetical here. Point is, is there is a purpose and a direction. And that plan de vida seems to be very important. There's even some literature now starting to come out in psychosomatic research that's looking at this. We're seeing that having a plan and a purpose can actually give you a drive to continue to live for a long period of time. So my takeaway out of this, I don't think I'm going to go eat a Nicoya diet. I don't feel particularly good with black beans. But what I have learned from this is that my minerals are important. I'm doing the right thing by eating a lot of poultry. I probably need to add some more squash into my diet. And I'm going to double, double down on my spring water. I'll see you tomorrow.